to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ in romans chapter 4 verse number 3 paul asked the question what does the scripture say we welcome you today to our study of answering denominational doctrines today we're going to be considering doctrines of the seventh day adventist religion and looking at those in light of the divine will of god found in the scriptures and so we encourage you to locate your bible have it handy as we're going to look to the word of god as our final authority we're so glad today that you've joined us for our study together. As always, we want you to know that today's lessons are being brought to you by members and congregations of the Churches of Christ. The Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly, either on Sunday or Wednesday night. You'd be an honored guest at any of their Bible studies or worship services. And friend, you'll find people in the Lord's Church who love God, who love souls and who are concerned about the truth of God's Word. Also, here at the Gospel of Christ, we're concerned about men and women knowing God's will and ultimately going to heaven. That's our main motive. That's our main emphasis is to help people make it to that wonderful home in heaven. Check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have a wide variety of good Bible study resources all of our video and audio lessons are on the website free. If you'd like to have a DVD or a CD as well, you can fill out a media request form or write to us or call us or email us. We'd be happy to send that to you free of charge. And don't forget, we have apps for both the iPhone and Android located in the Play and Google Store and the Apple Store there as well. And so check those out. They'd be a great benefit to you in your Bible study. Today we're going to be thinking about the various doctrines and teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist religion. And as we have tried to emphasize in our study of denominational doctrine, friend, we have no ill will toward anyone in any of these various religious organizations. There are good, sincere, kind-hearted people in every one of these religious organizations. And so this is a, not a matter of a personal issue. We just want to consider, do the doctrines that they teach line up with the divine will of God? And friend, we want to let the Bible be our sole guide. We want to realize the words of Jesus Christ, that's what's going to judge us. Jesus said in John 12, 48, He who rejects me and does not receive my word has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. It's the words of Jesus Christ who has all authority, Matthew 28, 18, and who is head of the church, Ephesians 1, verse 22 and 23, that's going to be our ultimate judge and guide uh, in this life and for the future. And so I want to put our trust and hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what do we know about the seven-day Adventist movement? This movement started somewhere around 1830. Officially, they might say 1843, 1844, somewhere in that time frame. It started, uh, of course, in the New York main area in the Northeast. And uh, their official headquarters is in Silver Springs, Maryland. According to Adventist.org, they note that their official headquarters is in Silver Springs, Maryland. Now, a big part of this is the founders of this movement. This movement began with a man by the name of William Miller, and it was later developed and popularized uh, by Ellen G. White, who many have heard of. In fact, they will look to William Miller and they will look to Ellen White as leading authorities and some of their prophecies. They will hold them up sometimes as prophets as well. 
Now, what is the authority then that the Seventh-day Adventists look to? Do they look to just the Bible? Or what is their authority? Adventists claim or affirm that the content of the church manual is the expression of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's understanding of Christian life and church governance and discipline based on biblical principles. It expresses the authority of a duly assembled general conference session. God has ordained, they say, that the representatives of His church from all parts of the earth, when assembled in a general conference, shall have authority. And of course, that comes from Testimonies, Seventh-day Adventist Church Manual, page number one. Now, friend, let's think about some of these items that we've mentioned as it relates to the history of the Seventh-day Adventist movement. And friend, as we compare this, please understand, we want to go back to the Bible as our only guide. When did the church that Jesus established begin? Was it in 1830 or 1843 or 1844? No, we read in Acts chapter 2 that the church Jesus started came hundreds of years, thousand years before that. And so the Lord's church started in AD 30, some would say AD 33, around that time frame. And thus, we know Christ's church started long before the Seventh-day Adventist movement. It did not start in New York or Maine. The Lord's church in Acts chapters 2 uh, following started and was promised to start by Jesus in Luke 24, 43 and Matthew 16, 18 in Jerusalem, lining up with prophecy, Isaiah chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2 tells of the Lord's church going forth, the word of the Lord going forth from Jerusalem and God establishing His house there. Well, who founded the church that we read about in the Bible? Not William Miller and not Ellen G. White. It was the Lord who said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. 1 Corinthians 3.11 says, No other foundation can any man lay except that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He is the founder and He's the foundation for His church. And so why would we want to build a movement upon men and their ideas and their alleged prophecies when Jesus has already founded and built His church? And friend, I hope you'll listen real carefully. The Bible teaches us that it is our sole authority, not a church manual, not a, quote, duly assembled conference. The Bible's our sole authority. Whatever we do in word or deed, we're to do all by the authority of Jesus Christ. The Scripture says in Colossians 3, verse 17, And friend, that Scripture doesn't need man's help, man's addition, church manual, or duly assembled conferences. For the Bible says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now listen to this, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Friend, the Bible tells us it's God's Word and it thoroughly equips man and it makes us complete. 2 Peter 1 verse 3, it's got everything we need for life and godliness. This is why Peter would say in 1 Peter 4 11, if any man speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. We don't need as our authority church manuals or traditions or some other man's alleged prophecies. Let's put our hope and trust in the Word of God. And friend, while we say this in kindness, please also understand that if William Miller and Ellen G. White are looked at as leading authority figures and are looked at at certain times at least as prophets, then friend, we need to examine that. And we need to actually see, did what they say actually come true? Can it be verified that they are prophets? Friend, let's put that to the test that we find in the Scripture. First, we want to lay out the test of Scripture. Then we want to align up William Miller and Ellen G. White's prophecies and see, do they fit the litmus test of Scripture? I want you to notice in your Bible, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse number 22. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen 
or come to pass, listen now, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken, the prophet has spoken it presumptuously, you shall not be afraid of him. And so in Scripture, what do we find as a litmus test for a true prophet of God? Well, the Bible clearly just said, says to us, if a prophet claims to speak in the name of, the God, of God and what he says doesn't happen, that's not God's prophet. He made that up. He spoke it presumptuously. Don't worry about what he said. And so let's look at their prophecies of both William Miller and Ellen G. White and see, did they come true? Did they make any false prophecies? If they did, then friend, we know they're not a prophet of Almighty God. Let me mention to you a couple concerning William Miller. Concerning the end of the world, uh, Miller will go on to say in Leroy Edwin Froome, The Prophecies of Faith of Our Fathers, on page number 463, he says this. Miller said, I was thus brought in 1818 at the close of my two-year study of the Scripture to the solemn conclusion that in about 25 years from that time, from 1818, all the affairs of the present state would be wound up. And so 25 years from 1818, he claims that it's all going to be finished, the world's going to end, all the current affairs are going to be wound up. Well, friend, did that happen? Well, of course not. That prophecy did not come true. We're still here today. All the affairs of the world were not finished up at that time. Coinciding with this prophecy, Miller further stated, that during the Jewish year, running from March 21st, 1843 to March 21st, 1844, in Francis D. Nichol, The Midnight Cry, page 169, he said that somewhere between March 21st, 1843 and March 21st, 1844, Christ would return. Well, friend, that didn't happen. The world was not wound up 25 years from 1818 Christ did not return between March 21st, 1843 and March 21st, 1844. Uh, further prophecy. When these prophecies failed, Miller later said, Were I to live my life over again with the same evidence I then had, to be honest with God and man, I should have to do as I've done. I, listen now, he said, I confess my error, I acknowledge my disappointment, yet Yet I still believe the day of the Lord is near, even at the door. And that's quoted by Sylvester Bliss in the memoirs of William Miller, page 256. And so Miller later went on to say, I said this was going to happen. I said the Lord was going to come. I confess I made some errors, but I probably would have done it all over again. And I think he's still coming pretty soon. Friend, here's what we know. Here's what we know. Uh, anyone who claims they know the date that the world's going to end or they know the date that the Lord's going to come back is just not being honest with Scripture and they're not being honest with people either. Listen to the words of Jesus. Here's a, a, a def. Anybody says, I know the exact time the Lord's coming back. You can put a check mark, mark by their name as a liar. We mean that in all kindness. For Jesus said this in Matthew 24, 36. Of His coming, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, but my Father only. And so this re religion, this uh, Seventh-day Adventist movement began with William Miller. Many people hold him up as a prophet, and yet he doesn't pass the litmus test. He readily admits that, uh, according to some of his own memoirs. Now, what about then the woman who later took and developed some of Miller's ideas, Ellen G. White. Many hold Ellen G. White as a prophet in the Seventh-day Adventist movement as well, and as such, she also should be subject to the litmus test of Scripture. Deuteronomy 18.22 says, If the thing a prophet says does not come to pass, that's not the Lord who said it. The prophet spoke it presumptuously, don't be afraid of what they say. Well, let's consider some of Ellen G. White's prophecies. On April the 7th, 1847, Ellen White had a vision where she was supposedly taken into the Holy of Holies and she saw the Ark and the Ten Commandments in the Ark with a halo of glory around the Sabbath commandment. 
Concerning Miller's chart later of the end of the world, Ellen G. White said, I have seen that the 1843 chart made by William Miller was directed by the hand of the Lord and that it should not be altered that the figures were as he wanted. And this is the early writings of William Miller, Ellen G. White, uh, page number 64. Now, friend, she claimed he was right, 1843. Ellen White eventually would go on to prophesy in the early writings as well on page 57 this. She said later on, now time is almost finished, 1851, and what we have been six years in learning, they'll have to learn in months, meaning that it's almost here, the Lord's about to come, we're getting real close. And yet, years later, Hundreds of years, that, that didn't happen. We know that didn't happen. And thus what we're trying to express is, just like William Miller, she would go on to make prophecies, many of those dealing with end times, second coming of the Lord, put dates on that, that would not happen. And so friend, we can know, according to the scripture, she's not a prophet of God. Now, she went on to say some other things that were also rather far-fetched. Many of these are recorded in Testimonies to the Church, uh, Volume 1, pages 224 and 225, and other places will record some of these. She said things like, cheese should never be introduced into the stomach. That's in page number uh, 254 and 255, as well as page 68 of Testimonies. She would go on to say, thousands have been induced to enlist with the understanding that this war is to exterminate slavery, talking about civil war, but now they're fixed that they find they've been deceived that the object of this war is not to abolish slavery, but to preserve it. And so she would kind of make these prophecies about things that are just far-fetched, not meant to abolish slavery, uh, it's meant to preserve slavery. And that's just totally infactual, not correct. Uh, she would say, eggs should not be placed upon your table. They're an injury to your children. She would say, we bear positive testimony, tobacco, rich cakes, liquor, snuff, tea, coffee, butter, spices, all these things uh, she was uh, you know, against. And some of those things she would go on to say about as well. And so what we just try to mention is that these people, William Miller, Ellen White both claimed to be prophets of God and yet on multiple occasions they would say things. Those things would not happen and friend we've got to realize according to Deuteronomy 18.22 they were not prophets of God. I do not need to listen to what they said, what they said and what they taught and the system of doctrine and religion they started is not in uh, accord with the teaching of the Bible. Now let's consider then some of the main doctrinal teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist movement. One of the most popular is that of Sabbath keeping. One of their main doctrines revolves around the Sabbath. Concerning Sabbath keeping, the Seventh-day Adventist Church Manual on page 15, Fundamental Doctrine number 19, says this. It says, the beneficent creator, after the six days of creation, rested on the seventh day and instituted the Sabbath for all people as a memorial of creation. The fourth commandment of God's unchangeable law requires the observance of the Sabbath day as a day of rest, worship, and ministry in harmony with the teaching and practice of Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a day of delightful communion with God and one another. It is a symbol of our redemption in Christ, a sign of our sanctification, a token of our allegiance, and a foretaste of our eternal future in God's kingdom. The Sabbath is God's perpetual sign of His eternal covenant between Him and His people. Joyful observance of this holy time from evening to evening, sunset to sunset, is a celebration of God's creative and redemptive acts. Friend, while there is no doubt, under the Old Covenant and under the Ten Commandment Law, the Israelites were absolutely commanded to keep the Sabbath. Sabbath keeping was not a command for all of creation. It was a command that started with the law of Moses and was for the Jews. Exodus 20 verse 8 
clearly teaches that. Exodus 31, verse 12, uh, Nehemiah 9, 14. There's just a host of passages. Uh, Deuteronomy 5, God gave this not to everyone else, but to Israel. This was a command not given to the heathens, not to everybody else, but He gave this to Israel, specifically to them and their fathers. And so the idea that this is for everybody, even today, doesn't even go along with the teaching of the Old Testament. And friend, let's also realize this. The Sabbath, like the teachings of the Old Testament, uh, many of those that we find under the Old Testament as well, they were done away with at the cross of Jesus Christ. I want you to see this for yourself in the Scripture that the Bible teaches the Sabbath, the Ten Commandment law, was nailed to the cross, and that is not a law that is binding on me or a law that I can break or keep today. Notice in your Bible a couple of passages. Turn in your Scriptures to Ephesians chapter 2, and I want you to notice what the Bible will say about the Sabbath and the Ten Commandment law in Ephesians 2, verse number 14. The Word of God records this. The Bible says, For He Himself, Jesus Himself, is our peace, who's made both one, Jew and Gentile, broken down the middle wall of separation, now watch this, having abolished in His flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in Himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. Friend, the Bible so clearly says in Ephesians 2, 14 and 15 that when Jesus died on the cross, part of what He abolished in His flesh was the law of commandments contained in ordinances. What's He talking about there? The old covenant law, that law that said, Thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, keep the Sabbath, all of that was a part of the Ten Commandment law given to the Israelites and Jesus came not to give us, not to make the Old Covenant for us today. Jesus came and brought the New Covenant. Uh, listen to Hebrews chapter 8, verses 12 and 13. The Bible says, in that He, in that Jeremiah said, New Covenant. He's made the first covenant obsolete. The writer would go on to say that which is growing old and becoming obsolete is ready to vanish away. It's obsolete. It's not for God's people today. And so in Romans 7 verse 1, Paul uses the example of marriage to show that Christians are no longer wed to the old law. We are now married to Christ. And here's what's real important. If you will read Romans 7 about verses 1 through 13, we can find out exactly what law and what covenant he's talking about. The covenant that said, thou shalt not covet, is a law that Christians are no longer wed to. Well, what else did that law say? That law that said, thou shalt not covet, the Ten Commandment law, also said, keep the Sabbath. Friend, Christians are no longer bound, we're no longer commanded to keep that law. And so there's the idea in the Seventh-day Adventist movement that the Old Testament law is binding on Christians today. In fact, here's what Adventists believe. Fundamental Doctrine 18, page number 15 of the Seventh-day Adventist Church Manual says this, The great principles of God's law are embodied in the Ten Commandments and exemplified in the life of Christ. They express God's love, will, and purpose concerning human conduct and relationship. Now, don't miss this. And are binding upon all people in every age. My well, friend, is that true? I want you to notice again what the Bible says in Hebrews 8. I mentioned it earlier, but I want you to see it for yourself. Would you look in Hebrews 8? Verse number 13 with me. Notice what the New Testament says. Again, the writer is quoting from Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34, where God says the days are coming when there will be a new covenant. And the Holy Spirit, in view of that prophecy, says this. Hebrews 8, 13. In that He, that's God, in that God says in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, new covenant, in that he says a new covenant is coming is the idea. He made the first obsolete. Now listen to this. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old 
in the New Testament, the Word of God says, is ready to vanish away. Friend, what covenant was that specifically in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34? Well, God said, it's the covenant when I took you by the hand to lead you out of the land of Egypt. What covenant did God make with His people after He led them out of Egypt? Well, we know on Mount Sinai, He gave them the Ten Commandment Law. Friend, we're not saying that's a bad law. Romans 7 says it was good and holy and just. But that law was for the Israelites. That law has been nailed to the cross. That law, according to Hebrews 8, 13, is obsolete and in the first century was already ready to vanish away. Now you think about things that are obsolete. I want you to think about things that there is no way you would go back to. How many women would go back to washing clothes in the creek on a washboard today? Well, that's not happening. How many people would want to go back to a, a horse and buggy type of transportation? How many would want to go back to some of the old archaic things that we've got such new and better things today? Friend, that's the idea. The Old Testament has been replaced by a new and better covenant, the final will of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, friend, we think about today the Seventh-day Adventist movement. We've looked at some of the pro false prophecies of William Miller and some of the false prophecies of Ellen White concerning end time coming of the Lord. We held that up to the litmus test of Scripture and we saw they're not true prophets of God. We looked at their idea of pushing the Sabbath keeping and the Old Testament today, and we saw where the Scripture said that law has been nailed to the cross. It was obsolete and ready to vanish away in the first century. And so, friend, much of the teachings will revolve around this idea. And as we think about seven-day Adventists, again, good, kind, sincere people involved in this movement. But friend, the teaching of it does not line up with the teaching of Scripture. And so as always, our encouragement is, let's go back to the Bible. Let's go to the Scriptures. Let's look to the words of Christ and let's be Christians only. Nothing more, nothing less. May God help us as we strive to do just that. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at one 855 458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788 McMinnville, Tennessee 37111 This is the Gospel of Christ